Good evening from NASA's Kennedy Space Center in Florida. I'm Stephen Clark from SpaceFlightNow.com. Reporting live on the launch of a Falcon 9 rocket. You're looking live at Space Launch Complex 40, where SpaceX has raised a Falcon 9 vertical. Uh, the Falcon 9 was rolled out to the pad last night and raised vertical overnight in preparation for launch this evening with the Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter Mission, or KPLO. This is South Korea's first deep space exploration mission, first mission of space exploration that that country has undertaken. This is a relatively uh, modest-sized spacecraft, about the size of a large refrigerator, but it carries six scientific instruments and tech demo payloads. Uh, it'll be doing a number of things, such as uh, studying lunar geology, uh, searching for evidence of water ice uh, accumulated in the bottoms of permanently shadowed craters near the moon's poles. Those uh, water ice deposits could be used uh, for resources for water or generating rocket fuel for future lunar explorers. And the mission will also demonstrate a deep space internet connection as a tech demo part of the mission. The spacecraft is currently buttoned up, cocooned inside the nose cone of the Falcon 9 out at Pad 40. Liftoff is scheduled for 7.08 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, or 23.08 UTC. If you've been following the launch industry today, you'll know it's been quite a busy day, uh, not just here at Cape Canaveral, but around the world. Earlier this morning, about uh, 12 hours ago, United Launch Alliance launched an Atlas V rocket from Space Launch Complex 41, just a mile and a half north of Pad 40, the pad you're seeing now. That Atlas V rocket uh, deployed a missile warning satellite for the U.S. Space Force, a successful mission in the, in the books for ULA, their fifth mission of the year, now complete. And now just 12 hours later, SpaceX is within an hour now of launching a Falcon 9 rocket just down the coast at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. This will be the uh, shortest turnaround between two orbital class launch missions from Cape Canaveral or the Kennedy Space Center since 1967 when two rockets, a Delta, a Thor Delta rocket and an Atlas Centaur rocket uh, took off nine hours and 53 minutes apart. So today's mission won't quite uh, eclipse that mark but it will uh, beat a record of roughly 24 hours between missions between two launches back in 1981. The overall record for the shortest turnaround, turnaround between launches here at Cape Canaveral is uh, 99 minutes. That occurred back in the Gemini program, uh, NASA's second human spaceflight program as part of uh, docking demonstrations. So it's been more than 50 years, 55 years now, actually, September 1967, that uh, we've seen two launches together two major space launches together, this close together at Cape Canaveral. Over the course of the afternoon, SpaceX's uh, ground team at Pad 40 has been completing closeouts and preparing the Falcon 9 for the start of propellant loading. The rocket has been uh, powered up at this point and propellant loading is due to begin at T minus 35 minutes or at uh, about 6.33 p.m. Eastern Time. Again, with the countdown targeting liftoff at 7.08 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time, or 23.08 UTC. This will be the 34th SpaceX launch of the year from uh, their launch pads here in Florida or in California, extending that company's record, uh, which was previously 31 launches in a single calendar year. They're now up to uh, 33, going for 34 tonight, and it's just August. The Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter mission will be launched on what's called a ballistic lunar transfer trajectory. This is a fuel-efficient trajectory that will take it uh, actually beyond the moon to a distance of uh, about four times the distance of the moon's orbit to the, what's called the L1 Lagrange point. It's a gravitational balance point uh, about a million miles or 1.5 million kilometers from the Earth in the direction of the Sun. 
And uh, at that point, when the spacecraft reaches that region of space, uh, gravitational forces will naturally send the spacecraft back toward the moon where it will intercept uh, the moon and be captured by the moon's gravity in December. So about a four month transfer from the launch pad here at Cape Canaveral to lunar orbit. Uh, that's uh, much longer than you may recall the Apollo missions from the 1960s and 70s just took a few days to get from Earth to the moon. But a, a trajectory like this, a ballistic lunar transfer is fuel efficient. It requires very little propellant from the spacecraft to actually execute these maneuvers. And it will end up uh, culminate with the spacecraft in orbit around the moon. And at that point, it can use its propellant. Instead of using its propellant to get to the moon, it'll be able to actually use its onboard fuel to maneuver into a low lunar orbit about 60 miles or 100 kilometers above the moon's surface, a polar orbit around the moon, to begin its science mission.
Now about three minutes remaining until the expected uh, pull or expected start of propellant loading on board the Falcon 9 rocket. Uh, we expect to hear confirmation of the go, no go poll from SpaceX's launch team shortly on uh, whether the team is going to be proceeding uh, down to today's launch opportunity at 7.08 p.m. Eastern Time. We're not aware of any technical issues and the weather appears quite favorable this evening for uh, liftoff from Cape Canaveral. Falcon 9 tanks are venting for the start of prop load. Launch auto sequence has started. And there we have confirmation of the start of propellant loading. This is a launch director on countdown with abort instructions for non-urgent no-go conditions. Brief the CERLD and they will approve the aborting the countdown. For urgent conditions affecting the safety of the operation, operators shall call hold, hold, hold on the countdown net. Launch control will abort the launch auto sequence immediately and proceed in the launch abort auto sequence. At T minus 10 seconds, launch control will be hands off and relying on automated abort criteria for the remainder of the count. Thanks, RC, for the uh, humble shout out there. Uh, for the team, the last time the CAPE launched two space mission, missions on the same day occurred on Veterans Day in 1966 when the CAPE launched an Atlas Agena D from Slick 14 and a Gemini Titan II from Slick 19 carrying NASA's Gemini 12 mission. It was a 12th man Gemini flight which successfully docked with the Atlas Agena as a proof of concept that docking between two separate spacecraft was feasible in preparation for the Apollo moon missions. That was almost 56 years ago, and cool that Falcon is flying a lunar mission today to help reset the clock. And we heard confirmation of the start of propellant loading and the start of the auto sequence there. So kerosene and liquid oxygen propellants now flowing into the Falcon 9 rocket. Everything on track for launch at 7.08 p.m. Eastern Time, 23.08 UTC, with the Korea... Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter Mission.
now inside of 29 minutes until liftoff. We've mentioned several times in our coverage today, both this morning for the Atlas V launch and in our coverage this evening of the Falcon 9 launch, uh, what the uh, records are for turnaround times between orbital class launches here at Cape Canaveral and, and at the Kennedy Space Center, which are uh, joined together uh, along the Space Coast at the Cape Canaveral Spaceport. So the record overall uh, actually is about an hour and 40 minutes. That occurred on four occasions. Uh, uh, all these turnaround times were about an hour and 40 minutes, plus or minus a minute or two, uh, between launches of uh, Atlas Agena rockets and Gemini Titan rockets. This is part of NASA's Gemini program that uh, practiced docking procedures in preparation for the Apollo lunar missions. Uh, Atlas Agena rockets launched target vehicles for Gemini spacecraft to rendezvous and dock with and these uh, launched on four occasions in 1966 uh, from different launch pads at Cape Canaveral, about an hour and 40 minutes apart. And then uh, after one orbit of the Agena target vehicle, once the vehicle had orbited the Earth one time, the Gemini Titan rocket with the crew of two launched to uh, rendezvous and dock with that target vehicle. That occurred on the Gemini 8, Gemini 10, Gemini 11 and Gemini 12 missions all in 1966 and that's the record uh, between two space launches here at uh, Cape Canaveral. Just the next year though there was another uh, dual launch uh, opportunity on unrelated missions on September 7th and 8th in 1967 uh, just nine hours and 53 minutes apart a Thor Delta rocket and an Atlas Centaur rocket launched uh, from different launch pads at Cape Canaveral. Uh, the Thor Delta launched a uh, satellite called Biosatellite 2 with uh, biological research experiments on board. It was a recoverable satellite. The Atlas Centaur launched NASA's Surveyor 5 mission, which landed on the moon. And then today's launches, if they occur, if the Falcon 9 launches on time, would occur 12 hours and 39 minutes apart between the Atlas 5 and Falcon 9. And then uh, this will bet beat uh, the mark that occurred in 1981 when two launches occurred 24 hours and 13 minutes apart, a Delta and an Atlas Centaur from different pads at Cape Canaveral. We had the opportunity to speak with uh, Colonel Mark Shoemaker, the Vice Commander for Operations at Space Launch Delta 45. This is the Space Force unit that oversees operations on the Eastern Range, and this is the unit that's responsible for public safety for all rocket launches that originate from the Kennedy Space Center and from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station. Colonel Shoemaker talked about some of the innovations and changes that the range has made in recent years to increase their uh, turnaround time, to improve their uh, responsiveness to commercial launch companies such as SpaceX that are launching more and more often here on Florida Space Coast. So let's listen to Colonel Sh uh, Shoemaker and his thoughts going into today's launch doubleheader. We're perhaps on the cusp of uh, another opportunity to launch two missions in one day this week on Thursday if weather and uh, technical uh, readiness holds. Uh, can you talk about proving out that capability and how your team approaches uh, uh, this opportunity. Sure, happy to do that, and, and thanks for uh, thanks for taking the time to chat about this really important topic for us. Um, you know, over the last two and a half years, we've been ready to do this, call it two and twenty-four, or even three and forty-eight, twenty-two different times. And unfortunately, either the rocket wasn't ready, or the satellite wasn't ready, the weather didn't cooperate. Um, but but essentially, we the, the the eastern range, we were we were ready to make it happen. And so the team has been really excited about making it, uh, being able to, to support that event and, and recognizing that we're only part of it, the, the launch vehicle and the satellites gotta be, gotta be ready to go. And whomever we're partnering with to make it happen, um, you know, we'll, be, we'll be really excited to, to, to pull it off with them. But what I think will be really key is that there's been a, a ton of hard work across our operations, our infrastructure, our instrumentation, technical pieces, our safety team, our, our um, just across the board, the entirety of our organization to, to get to this point uh, where, where we could demonstrate what we have said we can do 22 different times over the last two and a half years. And so um, the, the ability to, to make it happen on Thursday, knock on wood, uh, that, it, that it happens. And so I think it'll be just a validation to everybody that, that um, 
the, the areas where we spent time and effort to improve were the right places to go and, and, um, and that this just then becomes a kind of a, a normal service capability that we provide to anybody that wants to launch off of uh, Cape Canaveral. I've heard you talk before about how each of these, you know, launches when they're in close proximity to each other, you take them kind of on a case by case basis. Um, I know a big factor you've talked about is whether the rockets are using autonomous flight termination which SpaceX does. What are some of the other factors that come into play? Um, obviously, ULA doesn't quite yet, as, as I understand it. It uh, doesn't use autonomous flight termination yet. Um, right. What are some of the other factors that come into play and whether the range decides, yes, you know, we can do this or no, we need you know, 20, 24 hours or something like that, spacing between them? Sure, yes. I'm, no, I'm glad you emphasized the autonomous flight uh, termination capability. That That is fundamentally the number one thing that's going to unleash the capacity, agility, and responsiveness on the, on the ranges um, to, to meet the demand signal of the, of the launch customer base. Um, but, but other things that really have made a difference in our ability to, to, to uh, let's say, compress when T-zeros can, can happen you know, w you know, uh, in proximity to each other are a lot of efforts that our safety team has put in along with our operations team to to um, to work with uh, coordinating for air access to airspace or or the uh, reduction in um, uh, the 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 risk amount by just one order order of magnitude one million one in a million to one in a hundred thousand for certain public safety aspects those. Uh, improvements and tightening the analysis and understanding what risk really means to public safety has allowed us to shrink the areas where we're impacting uh, airspace and sea space, which then makes it a lot easier for us to say yes to launch requests. Those have been fundamental. We've done some work on the weather side to improve precision of what the weather team understands in terms of when the, the violations of launch uh, lightning launch uh, commit criteria are occurring. And so instead of uh, maybe a probability violation of 50, it's a probability violation of 40 that allows, and, and then when it gets time to, to the key decision on whether you fuel the vehicle or don't fuel the vehicle, we have better precision on, is it gonna be good Day weather program. or bad weather at, at T0? So that's been helpful. Also on the weather side, we did a significant amount of, of analysis and used some Air Force Institute technology students to help us refine going from a five nautical mile uh, ring around areas on the Cape for when you got to stop doing work due to lightning to four nautical miles. So when you change that, that radius from five to four nautical miles, you essentially buy 27% of time back for continuing operations. So all of these aspects go into this calculation determination of whether you can support activities in, in more closely space time. And so there may, be, may have been times in the past where we would have said no, not because the range couldn't have necessarily supported two, RP1 a particular activity within 24 hours of another, but because the, the activities leading up to that wouldn't have been able to be supported due to coordination with externals and, and, and refining some of those areas I just walked through. That was Colonel Mark Shoemaker, the Vice Commander for Operations at the Space Launch Delta 45 here at the Eastern Range at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, talking about uh, some of the uh, innovations and uh, changes that the range has made in recent years to accommodate more and more launches on the Space Coast, as well as uh, quicker turnarounds between launches. This is, again, uh, if this Falcon 9 lifts off tonight, this will be the quickest turnaround between two space launches here in Florida since 1967, September 7th and 8th, 1967. And uh, for decades, uh, the uh, range uh, was in a posture where they could only accommodate uh, launches on spans of about 36 to 48 hours, but that's changed in recent years with uh, several opportunities in recent years of, uh, in the last couple of years at least, of launches on the same day that have been delayed by uh, technical issues or weather but uh, today may be the day with the weather cooperating for both missions. The Atlas V got off the ground this morning, and the Falcon 9 is being loaded with propellant right now for liftoff at 7.08 p.m. Eastern Time with the Korea 
Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter Mission KPLO heading for the moon. If you're enjoying our coverage, we uh, invite you to uh, become a member, join our YouTube channel. And uh, if you do that, you'll be supporting our coverage and helping us continue doing what we're doing and providing new content for you for future launches here in Florida and around the world. So if you want to help us uh, keep doing what we're doing and bring you better content, please become a member. Join our YouTube channel, and you'll be doing just that. You can also contribute through Super Chat. If you uh, contribute through Super Chat, you'll also be helping us continue our coverage. And we also invite you to like our stream, and it helps us get gain visibility uh, for our launch coverage. So thank you so much for doing that. Thank you for listening to our coverage this evening of the launch of a Falcon 9 rocket with the Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter. This launch is now 17 and a half minutes away. Everything appears to be on schedule right now. Right now, the second stage of the Falcon 9 has been loaded full of kerosene fuel. The second stage is about to begin loading with liquid oxygen, this cryogenic oxidizer. The first stage is continuing to be loaded with kerosene and liquid oxygen in parallel at this moment. Stage two locks load has started. Spacecraft is on internal power.
Now T minus nine minutes and 25 seconds. We're showing a chart now showing the uh, history of orbital launch attempts from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station and the Kennedy Space Center dating back to 2000. As you can see, that launch rate has uh, accelerated in the last few years. There were a few years uh, in the 2000s uh, with as few as seven orbital launch attempts in a single calendar year. This tonight will be the 34th orbital launch attempt from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station or the Kennedy Space Center so far in 2022. Last year, there were uh, 31 launch attempts. So that record has already been broken. This is uh, the most number of orbital launch attempts uh, ever performed in a calendar year. And as I think we heard Colonel Shoemaker say uh, earlier in our show, uh, they've actually launched now actually 43 missions with the launch this morning of the Atlas V, 43 missions in the last 12 months, in the last 365 days. And tonight will be number 44 in that span. So the launch rate is accelerating and uh, the range is forecasting more than 60 launches in total, space launches, this calendar year. We're now looking at a live shot from the causeway from our photographer Michael Kane providing us this view uh, from the south looking uh, in a northerly direction toward the Falcon 9. The other view we've been showing looks toward the east, toward the uh, Pad 40 area. Now T minus 7 minutes and 45 seconds. Coming up in 45 seconds at the T minus 7 minute mark will be the start of the chill down procedure. This involves a flowing cryogenic propellants through some of the engine plumbing at the base of the Falcon 9's first stage booster to condition the uh, those lines and some of the engine components for the flow of cryogenic propellant in flight. That chill down will begin at T minus 7 minutes. This mission is the Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter mission. Here you can see that spacecraft in South Korea undergoing final testing before it was shipped to Florida for launch preparations in early July. As you can see, the spacecraft is about the size of a large refrigerator. It weighs about 678 kilograms fully fueled. That's 1,495 pounds in imperial, u imperial units. So it's a relatively uh, small spacecraft uh, from a Falcon 9 perspective. The Falcon 9 can lift uh, much heavier payloads to orbit and indeed toward the moon. However, uh, this mission is going uh, beyond the moon uh, to set up for its lunar, ballistic lunar transfer trajectory uh, to save propellant on the spacecraft. So the launch vehicle is giving it a little bit of an extra boost uh, and the spacecraft will in turn save propellant in that regard. So this is the uh, KPLO spacecraft that carries six scientific instruments and uh, tech demo payloads. It'll be surveying the moon, studying lunar geology, and there's an instrument called Shadow Cam, uh, funded by NASA Stage and one, developed at Arizona complete. State University on this uh, mission, with a camera 200 times more sensitive to uh, in low light conditions than the main camera on NASA's Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter. And scientists hope that this Shadow Cam instrument, which is derived from the LRO, Lunar Reconnaissance Orbiter instrument, will be able to peer inside these shadowed, permanently dark craters where the sun uh, uh, never reaches, where scientists have found evidence of l ice buildups and water ice deposits that could be used as a resource for future lunar bases or lunar explorers. And uh, this shadow cam instrument on this Korean spacecraft will uh, go a long way, scientists hope, in helping map out where those deposits actually are. We've heard confirmation at T minus seven minutes that the chill down of the Merlin engines began on time. So everything continuing to look good in the countdown this uh, evening.
Trying back recheck in progress. Stage one locks load is complete. Now T minus two minutes and 50 seconds. The strong back structure that you see on the right side of the rocket, that umbilical mast has retracted to an angle of about a degree and a half from the Falcon 9 rocket. The Falcon 9 at this point has been fully loaded with 46,000 gallons of kerosene fuel in both stages. Liquid oxygen loading will continue down to about T minus two minutes. About 30 seconds left until we expect to hear the call that liquid oxygen or LOX loading is complete. Now inside of two minutes until launch. Stage two locks load is complete. T minus 90 seconds, we've heard that call that the second stage liquid oxygen load is complete. You can see a vent there of some uh, vapors out at the pad. At T minus 60 seconds, the Falcon 9 will transition to onboard power, and the onboard computer will take command of that final countdown sequence, and propellant tanks will be brought up to flight pressure. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague Stephen Young now to call the final minute of the countdown. Falcon 9 is in startup. And there we have it, confirmation that the Falcon 9 is in startup. T minus 45 seconds. LD is go for 2 and 24. And a final go from the uh, launch director. T minus 30. T minus 20 seconds. At T minus three seconds, the engine controller will command the engine sequence ignition. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. We have ignition and liftoff. Liftoff of the Falcon 9 carrying a Korean lunar orbiter. The Falcon 9 has cleared the towers. Falcon 9 climbing away from Cape Canaveral. Power and telemetry nominal. Now one minute into Vehicle flight and approaching the point of maximum dynamic pressure. The 
Falcon 9 is being powered by its nine Max Merlin first-stage engines. There we have the Max-Q call from launch control. And back engine chill has started. T plus one minute, 45 seconds. Everything appears to be going normally during this launch. T plus two minutes. Falcon 9 is now heading down range. It's reached an altitude of over 37 kilometers. We'll be coming up on the first stage main engine cutoff. Main engine cut off. Main engine cut off. Stage separation confirmed. S stage separation. Looks like we have ignition. And back ignition. The second stage and back engine. Now switch to a view from the onboard cameras. Bearing this view coming from confirmed. SpaceX and uh, features a, a little bit of uh, delay. There we see fairing separation. The uh, audio feed from SpaceX comes in a little ahead of the video. Acquisition signal, Bermuda. On the left side of your screen, you're seeing the descending Falcon 9 first stage. And on the right side, the second stage, the engine burning away. The curve of the Earth now coming into view. Vehicle on nominal trajectory. Welcome back. I'm Stephen Clark back at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, we just witnessed a uh, spectacular evening launch here of the Falcon 9 rocket and the Korea Pathfinder lunar orbiter heading for the moon. Right now the Falcon 9's second stage as you can see in this uh, onboard feed provided by SpaceX on the right side of this split screen is firing to uh, place the Korea Pathfinder lunar orbiter into a preliminary parking orbit. Meanwhile the first stage booster on the left hand side of your screen you're seeing this first stage booster uh, begin its maneuvers to head back for landing on the drone ship. Uh, just read the instructions in the Atlantic Ocean, about 400 miles downrange, or 630 kilometers downrange from Cape Canaveral. This uh, trajectory is taking the Falcon 9 uh, just north of due east from Florida Space Coast out over the Atlantic Ocean.
stage one FTS has saved. Stage one entry burn startup. Stage one entry burn shut down. We've heard confirmation now guidance. that the first stage entry burn is complete. This is the burn of three engines. Three of the nine engines have uh, reignited for about a 20 second burn to slow the first stage down for re entry. Stage two FDS. This FDS. booster is booster number 1052. It's coming in for landing on its sixth mission to space. MVAC shut down. And there is cutoff of the stage second stage engine. Right on schedule. The first stage now is now, orbit insertion. now under the speed of sound heading for landing. And the f second stage with KPLO is in its parking orbit. We're standing by to uh, hear or see confirmation of the first stage landing. Stage one landing burn. Stage one landing leg deploy. Beautiful views of this uh, booster coming in for landing on the drone ship. We saw most of that descent. We're going to stand by for any confirmation from SpaceX on a successful landing of the first stage. Expected loss of signal. Keep. We've heard the expected loss of signal from Cape Canaveral. This means the second stage with the Korean Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter has passed over the horizon, heading eastbound over the Atlantic Ocean. Now in parking orbit, a second burn by the upper stage of the Falcon 9 is planned at T plus 34 minutes to send the KPLO spacecraft on its way toward the moon. Stage one landing confirmed. And there we hear, hear the verbal confirmation from SpaceX Launch Control that the booster successfully landed on the drone ship. This completes the sixth flight to space for booster 1052 in SpaceX's fleet.
expected loss of signal, Bermuda. Now 14 minutes since the launch of the Falcon 9 with the Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter mission. We showed you this slide earlier in the countdown uh, before liftoff, but now this slide uh, we can take it to the bank because this Falcon 9 got off the ground this evening. So here are the, uh, the uh, record turnaround times between space launches on Florida Space Coast dating back to the dawn of the space age. I mentioned before that uh, there were four occasions in 1966 of turnarounds between about an hour and 35 to an hour and 40 minutes between launches. And that was during the Gemini program when uh, Atlas Agena rockets were launched uh, to provide a target vehicle for docking demonstrations for the Gemini spacecraft to practice for future dockings necessary for lunar missions on the Apollo program. Those launches occurred about an hour and 40 minutes apart. And then in 1967, a year later, September 7th and 8th, on the night of September 7th and the uh, wee hours of September 8th, there were two launches, a Thor Delta rocket and an Atlas Centaur rocket, nine hours and 53 minutes apart. And then in third place is today, August the 4th, 2022, 12 hours, 39 minutes between the launch of the uh, Atlas V this morning by United Launch Alliance and the SpaceX Falcon 9 liftoff we just saw with the Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter. And then uh, in fourth place now, May 22nd, 23rd, 1981, launches were separated by about 24 hours. Uh, Delta and Atlas Centaur missions from different pads at Cape Canaveral. So tonight, today's uh, dual launch or launch double header uh, beats out that 1981 mark, uh, but still falls short of 1967. The uh, Space Force, uh, which runs the Eastern Range, says that they're ready to in uh, many cases, depending on the exact circumstances, they're ready in many cases to accommodate and support launches that are scheduled as few as four hours apart from different pads. Uh, we'll see if that uh, comes to pass, if there's an opportunity to demonstrate that capability in the coming months and years. Right now, the upper stage of the Falcon 9 is coasting over the Atlantic Ocean heading for the west coast of Africa and a reignition of the second stage engine at T plus 34 minutes and 15 seconds. Again, not only was it a busy day here at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station, uh, there were other launches across the U.S. space industry today. Uh, early this morning at 1 a.m. Eastern Time, Rocket Lab, uh, a California-based company which uh, launches out of New Zealand, launched a classified small satellite payload for the National Reconnaissance Office. And then at uh, 9 uh, shortly before 10 a.m. Eastern Time, or 9 a.m. Central Time, Blue Origin launched their sixth human spaceflight mission, a suborbital flight to the edge of space with six commercial passengers. So a very busy day for U.S. launch companies, Rocket Lab, United Launch Alliance, Blue Origin, and SpaceX all in action today from launch sites uh, here in Florida and in Texas and in New Zealand.
Now about 16 minutes remaining, one six minutes remaining until the restart of the upper stage. We're going to continue showing this map that's being provided by SpaceX. This is a SpaceX map showing the location of the second stage as it orbits the Earth. And we may get uh, more live views from the upper stage and from the rocket itself once it's back in range of a ground station, perhaps showing the burn of the upper stage engine and the critical deployment or separation of the KPLO spacecraft to begin its journey to the moon. That separation of the payload is expected at T plus 40 minutes.
Acquisition of signal, Gabon. Now about seven minutes, a little under seven minutes remaining until the reignition of the Merlin vacuum engine on the Falcon 9's second stage. This MVAC engine uh, burns kerosene fuel in combination with uh, cryogenic liquid oxygen. These are some of the propellants that were loaded into the Falcon 9 during the countdown that we were talking about earlier. The Falcon 9 upper stage with the Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter spacecraft still in tow, now flying over Africa.
Acquisition of signal, Melindy. The Falcon 9 is now in range of a ground station in Melindy, Kenya. Expected loss Kenya. of signal, Gabon. And it's passed outside of the range of the ground station in Gabon, but the uh, ground station in Melinda, Kenya, now has the Falcon 9 rocket. The signal from the Falcon 9 and is expected to be tracking uh, the upper stage during this upcoming burn. This burn will last about a minute and will give the Falcon 9 and the Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter the boost of energy they need to escape from their uh, current low-altitude orbit and head out toward the uh, lunar ballistic transfer trajectory, ultimately to a point about a million miles from Earth before coming back toward Earth and intercepting the moon to enter orbit around the moon. Nominal orbit insertion. We've heard a confirmation from SpaceX Launch Control of a nominal orbit insertion. So the second stage has done its job to send the Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter toward its destination. In four months' time, the spacecraft will be entering orbit around the moon after flying this uh, complex low-energy transfer, uh, fuel-efficient transfer, to reach the moon. Orbit, uh, the spacecraft is due to enter orbit around the moon on December the 16th. And it, after that orbit insertion on December the 16th, the spacecraft will spend a couple of weeks lowering its orbit with a series of propulsive burns with its engine to finally settle into a circular 100 kilometer or 60 mile high low lunar orbit around New Year's Day of 2023 to begin a primary mission expected to last one year, although uh, Korean officials have said they have enough propellant on board to extend that to at least double that to two years if uh, the spacecraft is performing well. Now, we're now about three minutes away from the expected time of spacecraft separation when we expect to see this uh, KPLO signal, Mauritius. spacecraft separate from the Falcon 9.
going by SpaceX's uh, predicted timeline, the time of payload separation is now less than a minute and a half away. The Falcon 9 with the uh, KPLO spacecraft still attached just uh, passed over the northern edge, the northern tip of Madagascar, heading now out over the Indian Ocean on this ballistic lunar transfer trajectory. The KPLO spacecraft uh, was built in South Korea on a budget of about $180 million. And it has six instruments, six scientific instruments and technology demonstration payloads on board. Um, the instruments include a magnetometer, uh, spectrometers to uh, measure the uh, composition of the lunar surface and regolith as well as a U.S. instrument from Arizona State University supported by NASA called ShadowCam to uh, look inside dark craters for signs of water ice. Coming up on payload separation. KPLO, deploy confirmed. We've heard verbal confirmation of deployment. Let's stand by to see that. And there it is. The Korea Lunar Pathfinder Orbiter flying free of the SpaceX Falcon 9 signal. upper Body. stage, which placed this spacecraft on a precise ballistic lunar transfer trajectory. SpaceX reported an on-target injection after that second burn of the upper stage. So after about six years of development and $180 million, this spacecraft, South Korea's first mission to the moon, on the way to its destination. SpaceX is uh, going to be wrapping up their live stream, so that's the last video we expect to see from the Falcon 9 this evening. By all accounts, the uh, mission has been successful. One more critical milestone to go. Uh, we may have to sign off before then, but we'll report it on social media and on spaceflightnow.com is the acquisition of signal from the South Korean ground team of uh, the communications from the KPLO spacecraft to ensure that the spacecraft is uh, alive and healthy following its uh, launch and ride to space this evening from Cape Canaveral, Florida. That confirmation is expected to come about 20 minutes or so after payload separation once KPLO passes inside the uh, range of a ground station, a deep space tracking station uh, that is uh, primed to detect the signal from the spacecraft. Also coming up will the, be the uh, deployment of the spacecraft's solar panels to begin charging its batteries for its mission. Before we sign off, we want to uh, invite you one more time to join and become a member of our YouTube channel. If you join, you uh, get some access to some exclusive video and you also are supporting our coverage and helping us bring you content and video like we brought you this evening of this spectacular uh, launch of the Falcon 9 rocket this uh, evening with the KPLO spacecraft. This mission, uh, also called Denuri uh, in South Korean, is uh, the first South Korean lunar mission, as I mentioned. It's also the uh, just the third moon mission uh, to launch from the Cape uh, in this century, since uh, the turn of the century, since 2000. So uh, moon missions aren't uh, an everyday occurrence uh, launching from here in Florida, or anywhere for that matter. But uh, there is another big moon mission right around the corner with the Artemis 1 mission uh, by NASA scheduled for launch no earlier than August 29th. That's the uh, massive, uh, huge moon rocket, the Space Launch System, currently inside the Vehicle Assembly Building, scheduled to roll out around August the 18th. Two weeks from today is the, is the current predicted schedule for that rollout to Pad 39B for final launch preparations after a series of uh, dress rehearsals and countdown fueling tests earlier in the year. That launch time, if it occurs, on August 29th is 8.33 a.m. Eastern Time, or 12.33 UTC. 
for a two-hour window on that morning. With another two launches now uh, accomplished today here at Cape Canaveral, Florida, let's look ahead at what uh, we'll be covering in terms of launch operations over the next week or so, next couple of weeks at least. These are the launches that we have confirmed dates for over the course of the next couple of weeks. On August the 6th, that's Saturday, uh, India, the Indian Space Research Organization, is scheduled to debut a new small satellite launch vehicle, the SSLV. This is a, a light-class rocket that uh, India has developed, solid-fueled rocket, to uh, carry its own microsatellites into orbit and also, they hope, uh, compete on the commercial marketplace with other small launchers. This will be its first flight, a demonstration flight, carrying a technology demonstration Earth observation satellite called EOS-2. This will launch from uh, Sriharikota Island on the east coast of India. And then SpaceX will be back in action later this month with two more Starlink missions through mid-August here at Cape Canaveral and the Kennedy Space Center. On the August the 9th, that's Tuesday, five days from now, a Falcon 9 is set to launch another batch of Starlink Internet satellites. That launch is scheduled for 6.59 p.m. Eastern Time, another evening launch, uh, nearly the same time as tonight's mission from Pad 39A at KSC. And then a week later, the next launch from Pad 40, after tonight's launch from Pad 40, is another Starlink mission, Starlink 4-27, on a Falcon 9 rocket. We've also heard just today... Uh, that uh, the next SpaceX mission, according to the Western Range and Vandenberg Space Force Base, is scheduled for August the 12th. That's the next Falcon 9 launch from the West Coast on August the 12th, a Starlink mission as well, with another uh, cluster of Starlink Internet satellites. So three SpaceX missions on tap. One of those we didn't get a chance to add to this chart, but three SpaceX Falcon 9 launches scheduled over the next 12 days and this has been a common theme throughout the year uh, with SpaceX missions averaging about once a week or so, a little bit better than once a week. So uh, today's Falcon 9 launch was actually the first SpaceX launch in 11 days, a, a, uh, a relatively long break in launch activity for SpaceX this year, but they're going to pick up the pace later this month with 
three more missions in the next 12 days. So we'll leave you with one last look of Space Launch Complex 40 at Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. An empty pad where the Falcon 9 took off at 7.08 p.m. Eastern Time, 23.08 UTC with the Korea Pathfinder Lunar Orbiter Mission. We've talked about that mission. We'll have a full report on the science behind that mission later on spaceflightnow.com. And we'll update you if we hear word uh, that the ground teams in Korea have confirmed the spacecraft's health after tonight's launch. So until next time, I'm Stephen Clark from spaceflightnow.com reporting live from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. We'll see you next time.